my talk is about going mastic, or as I like to call it, call it uh, logging all the things. Um, so really, all the things we want to log. Uh, for those who don't know me, um, I'm Philip. I'm working for Elastic in Vienna normally. Uh, my role is normally infrastructure, so I'm doing all the things with Jenkins for testing, as with Chef, doc, uh, Puppet, automation, Docker images, everything related to AWS or the other cloud providers. <coughs> and this here is actually a Unix pipe, and I kind of pipe that into developer advocacy, so I'm out at lots of conferences doing talks and just trying to get the good word out and show what we're doing normally. Um, so I'm actually not that much in Vienna, like a few days every month now, uh, but I came back yesterday to do the conference today. So if you are interested in working for Elastic, we're always hiring, um, but we don't have an office here. Like, I'm currently the only one in Austria, uh, since we are very remote friendly, so it's kind of a different culture. No offices, um, no big spaces, nothing. And I'm also running meetups. So if you're interested, for example, in <coughs> databases or more academic papers, like this is already a very academic uh, setup. Um, once a month, we meet at Stockwerk, where the event is tomorrow, I think. Um, normally in the kitchen is just a bunch of people, like four to eight normally, who talk about one paper, so you get a paper a month, uh, you read it, you hopefully learn something from it, and then we discuss it together. So this is more the, the academic side, and I'm running the database group that is the practical side, where we talk about different database systems. For example, in, in a few weeks, early December, we talk about relational databases, also more a discussion round, and we also do a MongoDB meetup pretty soon. So, who's using all the latest shit stuff, whatever? Good. Uh, with shit and stuff, I, I normally mean stuff like microservices, containers, unikernels, whatever, like highly distributed, just the latest and greatest, whatever comes to your mind. Um, so, actually who uses 10 or more service containers, something like that? Okay, just a few. Um, it's always surprising. Um, I was at the meetup last week, and there were three guys, and I, I would have estimated they were 14, and then they told me like they are running one of the largest um, uh, game server setups worldwide, like they have 700,000 active gamers at their peaks with 300 servers. And I thought like, well, they are not even at university. Um, but obviously people run these setups and if you have just like two or three servers or hundreds of servers, you probably want to have some proper form of logging stuff. Um, so how are you logging? Um, if you have more than a handful of servers and your answer is SSH plus K, that is probably not the right answer. Because if you have more than five SSH uh, windows open and then you just need to jump between the windows and you don't know which server is which and you try to find stuff, um, that won't scale at some point. And yeah, you will be stuck and it won't be fun and you probably won't see the right stuff in the noise with all the logs. For example, if one component starts to log way more than normally, you have no way of actually knowing what it's doing because you just don't see it in the noise of all the other ones. So let's take a step back. What actually is a log? For me, normally a log is something that has a timestamp. So it happened at some point in time. And then there is some log message. And that message can be totally unstructured. It's just like text. Or it can be structured and have some format. So it could be a structured log where you have some format like XML or JSON, or it's just plain text and you would need to parse it then. So for example, if you have an Apache HTTP log or an Nginx log, that's not JSON, that's just a log line, but there is a pattern to it. So you know, okay, this was the return code, this was how many bytes were sent, um, this was the requested URL, um, this was the HTTP verb you were using. All these things um, you would have in a log message. And everything that has timestamp and whatever is in the log afterwards, um, that I would consider a log. So now that we have a log, what are we going to do with that? Um, normally, you would, at least if you have lots of servers, you would want to centralize that. And if you have centralized it, you want to probably parse it. And then you want to be able to search it efficiently, probably even graph it out. Um, and at the end, probably get a little of like, hey, bad stuff has been happening. Do something. Fix it. 
So we have a solution there. Um, let's see how that works. So Elasticsearch was started in 2010. Actually, who has used Elasticsearch already? Very good. Um, who has heard of Elasticsearch? Yeah, yeah, okay. That's one group includes kind of the other, but just to, to get the feeling. Um, tagline is, you know, for search. Um, for those of you who don't know what Elasticsearch is, there's already search in the name. It was, it started off as full text search. So you would just have a large text body and you wanted to search for it. Um, our current CTO at Elastic, Shai Bannon, he started the project. And actually, it's kind of a funny story how he got started. Because I think he was living in Israel with his wife. And, sorry? Exactly, exactly. Um, he was working uh, in Israel and his wife got a job as a chef in London. And so they moved to London. He didn't get a proper job there. Um, he was just coding at home. I always imagined him sitting in his bedroom and coding rigorously. And his wife had all these recipes, uh, but she couldn't really search them. So he made an application for her to actually search her recipes. And that is how the entire company got started. Or at least that's the legend how everything got started. And he, he had two products before it. The first one was called Compass 1, second one Compass 2, and then it was Compass 3, kind of, and it was called Elasticsearch. And three is obviously the lucky number, and that one really took off. The other ones were all also used, like uh, at my ex company, people used Compass 2 already, um, but it never really took off and it didn't get a proper community around it. Uh, but Elasticsearch, like three lucky number, that one really took off. It was started in 2010 and has grown very rapidly since then, and it's now widely used. So. Lots of sites where you're searching, um, you will have Elasticsearch in the background, even if you don't know it. Um, these guys, for example. Um, I guess I don't know, I don't need to tell you who these three are. Um, each one of them, if you are searching behind the search box, uh, there is Elasticsearch running. And there are loads and loads and loads of other pages where Elasticsearch is running. And then people said, well, this is nice, uh, but we need other tools around it. So, Two other projects started outside of the company. The first one is Kibana. Kibana is the visualization um, part. It's, we always call it the window into your data. So you can actually see what data you have. It's very easy to explore or to graph out stuff. Um, we'll see how it actually works uh, in practice of the data. And the second one is Logstash. Logstash, wooden log, uh, always also has the name log in it. Um, so the idea was just get logs, parse them, and store them in Elasticsearch centralized, so you can actually search them afterwards. But now Logstash is much more. Logstash is, originally it was written in Ruby, now it's JRuby for performance reasons, so you need the JVM. But it has more than 200 plugins, so you can get data from loads of different sources, so you can read files, you can read plain TCP UDP, you can read from lots of queues like Kafka, RabbitMQ, ZeroMQ, Redis, whatever. You can read from SNMP, you can read from Twitter, you can read from WordPress, whatever. So you can just ingest data from lots of different sources, parse them, and then store them either in Elasticsearch or you can parse them out to some other destination. For example, the destination might be you just write out plain files, Netflix files to Amazon F3 um, just to store data. And that was called the well-known Elk Stack. ELK, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana, and it even had this, the Elk as a logo, and we even had it as a plushy Elk, like the mascot animal uh, you could carry around. Some of my colleagues are still taking that everywhere uh, and taking pictures with the Elk, uh, but that was the good old Elk. And most of the people are still referring to it as the Elk Stack, because, well, the name is kind of sticks very well. And that is also very widely used. So, for example, CERN, they have loads of computers and they just get all the logs from the different uh, systems, centralize them and store them. Same thing for Salesforce with their cloud solution, um, just get all the logs and see that if you have like hundreds or thousands of servers, that is very useful. Uh, for Goldman Sachs, the story is a bit different. Goldman Sachs um, is doing good and sometimes bad stuff. And for the bad stuff, uh, every now and then they need to pay a big fine. And Every now and then they, I don't know, they, they pay dozens or hundreds of millions of dollars in fines. And at some point they kind of decided, well, 
this is stupid. Um, maybe we can avoid paying those fines, so we need a proper auditing system. And the bin set and part of it is Elasticsearch. So they are tracking all the activities in their systems and try to actually alert somebody some bad stuff is happening. Um, so we should avoid that or try to counter that. And so they can also prove like, hey, we are trying, we are trying to avoid bad stuff. Um, we shouldn't get fined for that. And I'm not really, really sure how well it is working out, but this is a general idea, like uh, avoid the big fines by investing probably a tenth of what they would need to pay in fines and some technology to find the best stuff. So auditing and compliance also for credit cards and lots of other systems, uh, that is where the stack is very widely used. That's all that's nice one. And then this little fellow came along. This is Beats, um, a new product. Um, it's like a lightweight agent, forwarder, shipper, whatever you want to call it. The problem with Logstash is it's very versatile. Um, you can use it for many different purposes, but it is kind of heavy. So you have the JVM, and yeah, it takes some time to start up. It takes up quite some memory, and especially if you're not a Java shop, you do not really want to put the JVM on your servers just for logging. People just didn't want to do that. So they would use systems like remote syslog, um, or there are some other products around that just for this log shipping part. And then there was the Beats product, and that also joined the family. We also, we never really say like they were acquired, they always joined the family, like uh, Kibana and Logstage, they also joined the family, uh, and the same way Beats joined the, the Elastic family. And Beats is written in Go, so you get native system binaries without any dependencies. Uh, you install them on your servers and they're just built for a single purpose. For example, we have something called FileBeat to forward your log files. And we'll take a look at other beats as well. So these are just very lightweight. They just collect information and forward it. And yeah, they shouldn't interfere with your system resources in any way or that, as little as possible. The only problem is um, with the X stack, there is no B or no B for beats. Um, so the X had to die. No, don't worry, we didn't kill yet. Um, it is just retired. It is happily living ever after. Um, it is not bad, it's just like we are trying to get kind of rid of the Elk stack or the term because it's kind of old for us and we've been trying to get rid of it for a year or so. And whenever we see somebody starting or create a meetup event or something where they say they will talk about the Elk stack, we were first we were very happy because it's always nice to see people talk about our stuff. But B, we will raise the egg alert. So somebody from marketing will reach out and will try to get rid of that egg term and say, hey, please rename it because we have a new name. And we tried this one first. This is the, the belt or the egg B, where you can see it's B with the egg box, so the egg B or belt. And that, that was an initial marketing idea. And one of my, I think one of my Australian colleagues liked it so much that he himself created stickers out of that. So there are very few people, but there are some who have the bell as a sticker on their laptop. Unfortunately, I didn't get it yet. Uh, and I'm not sure if we we're out of that. So we tried with the, the bell for the LP, but then marketing said, well, what if we add more products in the future? It will get harder and harder to find a new animal or make up another animal uh, just with the right letters. So this probably won't really scale. And we always need to redo all the marketing and then uh, once we've renamed, uh, we, we need to reach out to everybody to get rid of the back stack or HP stack. So that's not so great. So yeah, we went for the less creative solution and now it's simply called the Elastic Stack. So Elastic the company, and uh, logo just to strengthen the brand. And whatever products we have, we can kind of easily put that into the Elastic Stack. So from now on, everything is the Elastic Stack. Um, that should scale for us as well. So whenever somebody talks about the exec, it's, it's not incorrect. And whenever people come to me and talk to me, like 80% will still say the elk stack because this is what they have been using. But we try to get the word out that we want to call it the elastic stack. Let's see how successful we are and if we're still fighting the elk in a year. Um, so the components we have here now are Elasticsearch, the obvious one for storing your data when you query it, um, Kibana to visualize it, Beats, the lightweight agent to just forward and chip it, and Beats can either store data directly in Elasticsearch, or if it needs parsing, 
it can forward the data through logstash, and logstash can parse the data for you. So Beats is not really getting rid of logstash. Logstash is just getting a bit of a different job. So logstash has all these plugins. Probably there won't be plugins for every uh, for everything that uh, or Beats implementation for everything logstash does. So there is no Twitter feed, for example. If you want to ingest data from Twitter, you will still need logstash today. And for many other things, you will still need logstash today. Um, Beats is just like, this is what you want to put on all your dozens or hundreds of servers, and they will just collect the information for you. And all these products are open source and available for free. So if you want to spin up a cluster and just monitor it, just grab that and get going. Um, we don't even have commercial versions from these pieces, um, since we do not believe it. Some of our competitors do that, they have commercial and open source version. Uh, but we admitted to ourselves that we are lazy. Um, why lazy? Normally what people would need to do is, like you have the commercial version, you will start testing the commercial version, and then before the release you will remove some features or make the product somewhat worse, and then you would need to retest everything. Um, yeah, but we, we would be happy like, if you could properly test everything once, properly, uh, so there is no way to test everything twice, so we just do open source releases for everybody. Um, how do we make money? Um, that's actually the next slide. Um, another thing that might be confusing is, so far, we've had different version numbers since we had uh, different products. All of them joined the family at different points, uh, so the version numbers were not aligned. So it was the current versions of was up until 10 days ago, Elasticsearch 2.4, but Kibana was 4.6, uh, Beats was 1.3, and Logstash was 2.4 as well. And if you ask me, like, what is the right Elasticsearch version for Kibana 4.2, I would have no idea. We, we have a compatibility matrix where you can look that up, like, I have this version and this version, do they match and what other pieces fit together. But this was getting way too complicated for us, even for us, when we produced the software. So we decided everything goes to version 5, so all the products are now at version 5. Why 5? Because Logstash was at 4.0. Six, so the next available major version was five. Um, and since Elasticsearch jumps from two to five, you can see it's getting much more mature and way better. <laughs> like, such a big version jump needs to be justified by something, so it's way better now. Um, and this is actually how we make money. So these are all open source and there are no commercial versions. If you do not want to host it yourself, um, we have that on AWS at the moment. So we call it Elastic Cloud. What Amazon provides is actually a competitor, and people often confuse that. So sometimes people come to me and say, this feature is broken. And then when we look at it, we see, oh, this is the Amazon version you're using. This is a competitor. I cannot help you with that. Uh, we are providing hosting for that. If you're a really big company, and especially in the <coughs> German-speaking world, people want to keep their data in-house, uh, we are about to provide that uh, on-premise as well where you just have a nice interface and you can create a cluster with Docker images in the background and you will just spin up a specific version and you have a nice upgrade path and everything. And if you're a bigger company and you need support, uh, we provide support for all the products we have. Plus, if you get the license, we provide commercial extensions. So these are called x and these are the commercial extensions we provide. So everything related to security, alerting, we have a graph co a component, uh, monitoring, and newly reporting. Uh, that would be commercial extensions. So that is where we actually make money. But the core products are all open source, and you can just use them to monitor your service. And for most open source or startup problems, this is actually what all they need. So we're not even trying to convert them to paying customers. Just for the more enterprise world, if you're a bank or an insurance company, you always need yeah, more features and support, and we're happy to provide that. So, how do we actually collect all the things? Since I wanted to say, yeah, talk is also about collecting all the things, uh, what are the beats doing? Um, first off, there is file beat. It's just tail f over the network. That's my short description of it. It's just reading a file, and everything new that comes in will be forwarded to either Elasticsearch or Logstash. Um, nothing more, nothing less, so that should be very lightweight. Then we have metric beat. Metric beat collects all the system metrics. Previously, we called it the top beat, since it collected what's the top 
the Linux command top did, even though it's working on Windows as well. Um, but we are now not limited anymore to CPU, memory, I.O., uh, processes, etc. Uh, metric feeds are, can do more stuff now. For example, they can get metrics from Nginx, Apache, MySQL, MongoDB, Postgres, Cassandra, more and more systems. So we're just getting meaningful metrics from all these um, applications or your processes and can then store and visualize them so you see uh, what the systems are actually doing. So for example, if you add that for Nginx, you can see a number of requests and all the state that Nginx is doing to serve up your content. Then we have packet feed. So who is using Wireshark? Anybody using Wireshark? Yeah. Wireshark is very nice, as long as you need to monitor the network traffic on a single server. As soon as you have more servers, stuff gets a bit more painful. Because then you would need to capture packets on different servers, then you would probably need to merge them together. And then you can only analyze them with Wireshark. And the more servers you have, the more painful this will actually get. So what PacketBeat is, it's using uh, the same space library and to actually collect what is going on on your network interfaces. It normally just extracts the network headers and stores that in Elasticsearch. So this is actually quite clever. For example, if you do an HTTP request uh, and have the response, PacketBeat will know, okay, this was the request, this was the response. The whole thing, so 90 milliseconds, it was HTTP, the response code was a 200, um, the, re the URL you requested was foobar, and all of that is just extracted from the headers. So just based on that in, uh, information, you know which are my, my slowest URLs. Um, <coughs> do I have more 400s or 500s suddenly than I had yesterday? Um, you can calculate percentiles, so you can extract lots of meaningful information all without instrumenting your own application. This is just extracted from the network headers. And we also provide WinLogB. Um, so if you're on Windows, I'm sorry for you, um, but if you need to collect uh, these, there's this, I'm, I'm always forgetting the name, what, what is that, that application called to where you can show the, 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 met, the logs in Windows? It, is, it, it has its own application, it doesn't, well it's Windows, it doesn't block to, to plain text files. It's, yeah, it's doing its own thing. Um, and to actually get the data out of that, we have WinLogB. It will just get all the information Windows is generating internally, forward that into Elasticsearch, and then again you can um, view that and search it in a meaningful way and you're not bound to the Windows ecosystem. So especially if you have Windows and Linux systems mixed, uh, this is kind of nice to keep your sanity and not being bound to any Windows binaries that you'll see a lot. And we have lots of community things. Like, you can write your own read <coughs> if you see that some information is missing from what you need. Um, so for example, we have docbeat, since Docker is on the rage, everybody needs to have something for Docker. So you just run it on the host, and it can extract meaningful, I think we have seven metrics at the moment, it can extract that from the host system for all the <coughs> containers that are running on your system. And at first, we wanted to call it Dockerbeat, or actually we called it Dockerbeat, or the community called it Dockerbeat. And then Docker reached out and said, well, Docker as the first thing is trademarked, uh, so you need to rename it. So, yeah, we dropped the ER, and now it's called Dockbeat, and everything is well again. Uh, we even thought about just dropping the E and call it, calling it Dockerbeat, um, but yeah. Didn't get a majority, so Dockbeat it is. It is uh, done by, I'm not sure, either French? Uh, some, or at least somebody is uh, doing the doc beat, uh, but soon it will be also available in metric beat, since again, it's a system metric, so we will just put it into the overall metric beat, and that will collect all the metrics from the servers, uh, including Docker. So it's not merged yet, or maybe it's in master branch, but it's not in any uh, version branch yet. <coughs> then we have Spring Beat. So if you are using Spring Boot to write your applications, uh, you have metrics and health normally exposed. These are just two REST endpoints which expose information about your application, so what is going on in the system. And somebody wrote a beat for that, so it will just call that endpoint, collect the information continuously, and store it in Elasticsearch so you can uh, visualize it later on or see what has been going on historically. 
So that is kind of useful. There are not that many uh, commits to that uh, beat yet, but I think it's working kind of well. Um, yeah, let's see where that can go. Or journal B. So if you're using a modernized distribution and you're bound to system B, which uses journal D to log everything, it doesn't write out stuff to log files anymore. And then people always complain, well, yeah, sure, I can write everything out to a log file now, but that is just an unnecessary overhead. So I have it in journal D, I can write it out to a system log file, then the beat will collect it, and then I need to parse it again somewhere else. Sounds kind of a waste, and you don't need to do it. Uh, there is a journal beat um, by the community right now. We might provide something ourselves since journal D is yeah, getting the default Hector standard. Uh, we might provide something for that in the future as well. And there are other easier bits. For example, there is a very simple exit bit. Run hello world against, uh, echo hello world against uh, test host every 10 seconds. So whatever shell script you have, you can simply run that and store the result in Elasticsearch. It won't be very meaningful in that example, but you get the general idea. So if you have this, these random shell scripts, you can simply run that with a bit and store the result in Elasticsearch term. Or if you have lots of Nagios checks and you have invested lots of time in creating checks with Nagios, but you do not like the interface to interact with the results in Nagios anymore, um, you don't have to. Like we can run your uh, Nagios checks like um, every hour check um, the disk space or every minute check the system load and store that information in Elasticsearch form. And you can write your own beat. Um, we provide, provide a base library. So this does kind of all the hard lifting. So it interacts with Elasticsearch, Redis, and uh, Kafka for you. Um, it will set up a cell encrypted connections. It uh, just provides the base library or framework. And you just need to add the bits and pieces, um, whatever you need to collect. So for example, one of my colleagues, he's, he likes music. So he created his music beat, which is totally pointless. But it's kind of a nice exercise. So he found, um, or he used a, a Go implementation to, to get the amplitude of an MP3 track. And he would just provide the MP3 track to the B. It would extract the amplitude, store it in Elasticsearch, and in Kibana you could visualize the amplitude then of the song. Which doesn't make much sense, but it's just, he just wanted to show like, hey, you just get get the information, and this is how to run through the entire pipeline, and it's pretty easy to get started. And I think he's, he's a Java programmer, and it took him like one or two days just to get everything up and running, so it's, it's easy. Yeah, and since I've done so much talking now, we can actually show what is going on. So this is Kibana, we will just use Kibana to interact with everything. Um, I'm using the latest version, which is 5.0. So, is it large enough or should I make it? I can make, make it slightly larger. That's readable also for the last row? <coughs> Good. So the tool I'm using here, that is called console. Um, it is pretty much like curl to interact with it. Um, so the command I've done here, the get, that would be the same as if I did curl uh, x get localhost 9200, which is the default port of Elasticsearch. So this is giving me the same result as this. This is just a nicer syntax, syntax highlighting, um, auto-completion, and it will tell you when you yeah, do bad stuff. So we can see we're using Elasticsearch 5.0.0, which came out 10 days ago, which was kind of a big release. Um, it is actually the hard lifting in the background is done by Apache Lucene. That is the library doing the full text search in the background. So Lucene is doing the full text search part, kind of, and Elasticsearch is the wrapper around it and it provides the REST interface, the query DSL, it does all the distribution and replication of the data. But Lucene is actually doing the full text indexing and storing the data. So every now and then people ask like, okay, what database are you using or what is storing the data? Um, that is actually what Lucene is doing. And the tagline is still itself, that's the same, you know, for search. Um, we have cluster ID, we have cluster name. What is kind of new uh, is the name of this node. Does anybody know what the na node name was previously? 
exactly. It was Marvel superheroes or villains or whatever. Um, so previously, in the beginning, there was a very, I think it was pretty much from the beginning of Elasticsearch, there was a very long list of Marvel superheroes. And if you did not give the known name, the node, an explicit name, um, I didn't, it would pick one random superhero at start time, and the node would then be called, I don't know, whatever they are, they or, or whatever it would be called. So it would always be kind of funny to see, okay, my node is called this today, my node is called this today. This worked, um, but it had two drawbacks. The first one is, it would not be persistent across restarts. So the new ID is just like something that is guaranteed to be unique. Uh, this will be uh, unique around, um, around restarts. So this is kind of helpful if your server kind of crashes or whatever, you just restart it. If you always get a new node name, it's kind of confusing to know which node was which one. This is now persistent. And B, um, the legal department was pretty unhappy. And the bigger the company becomes, uh, the more important legal gets. And the legal department was kind of, well, we never asked really for permissions, and are we allowed to do that? And yeah, just to be, to be sure, just to make legal happy, please drop the modern superheroes and use something else, whatever. Um, yes, so we complied. So a little less fun, uh, but this still works. Um, so let's see. The first thing we have here is the cover, and this is just um, collecting uh, three different metrics here. I'm collecting. I have five week running. This is all running in a virtual machine, so this is kind of monitoring itself um, and also driving itself. Uh, so we have five week, which collects some. Some log files, for example, we can see here. Um, yeah, this was packet feed. Um, logs in var log packet feed, packet feed, and we got some log message, whatever info message here is being output. Uh, and we're collecting that. And we're collecting all the other system metrics we have in our system. We have metric feed, where we can see, okay. Here it's collecting CPU process time for the process name, the case of IRQD. Um, and you can see, okay, so much uh, CPU time, um, those were the, the file script limits, uh, and lots of other information. Like, if everything was running on many systems, uh, you could see that the host name would make sense. But in this example, since everything is running into my, in my own VM, the host name does not make much sense. So normally you could just have all the host names and then say, just give me the information for one specific host or one specific process. Uh, and you could really filter down that. And the final one is uh, packet feed, which will just, all the requests I'm doing in Kibana will be web requests. So all the requests will then show up here. So let's see what I've done. Um, so it was my destination port was 9200. Um, I did a request against uh, yeah, Elasticsearch. It got some random flow ID. So flow ID is always like to know what, what is the request, what is the response, to know what is actually the transaction. And you can see when it was, source code, uh, how many bytes were transferred, uh, all of that kind of information. And you can also, if you, this is the table view, if you want to switch to the JSON view, you can actually see, okay, this was the original message uh, that was locked. So you have destination, you have source, start time, fields, um, all the information you might want to be able to search, group by, uh, yeah, limit, whatever you want. Uh, but this is not only limited to anything related to system metrics, you can also use it for uh, your own application data. So I just need to add the index, I have created a new index, um, which should be called person, let's see. Hopefully, oops, this won't do that now. <coughs> so I have generated some data randomly. Let's see what we have created. So we have persons here, and my persons are inserted or by their birth date. And I have not created anybody in the last 15 minutes, so this is empty. I'm switching now to a different time view. So let's say I probably have created people in the last, or have been born in the last 80 years. 
Yes, and I had inserted one million people, so I got the entire time slice. And you can see my random algorithm was not that clever or that random, or I don't know. Uh, you can see we started in 1940 and ended before 2010. Uh, and we just inserted a million people just to play around with some data. And if you look at one person, you can see they have a timestamp that was their birth date. Uh, they're a person, they have a city, a country, they have actually a geolocation, uh, a zip code, and their yeah, gender, and some other attributes. And with one million data sets, you cannot really see what data you have or what is going on. So now we want to, to actually visualize stuff and see what is going on in your data. Um, so for example, you could build uh, an area chart, but let's go for a pie chart. So I, I'm using a person, this is my index I want to, to use, this is where I have stored all my persons. And I, so just to give you the right idea, normally this looks like this, uh, since I have increased the screen size, yeah. Let's stick to that so you, we can see everything. Uh, so I have my one million entries right now, and I want to see like what is the gender distribution. And you can just say, I want to split my slices, and I want to do that on a term. And the term will be the gender. So there should be um, gender as feed. And I want to run that. And then you can say, OK. Approximately 51% of my uh, population is female and 49% is male. And then we could, for example, say, um, I want to see how that is split up then uh, within countries. So I can add a sub bucket, for example. I split my slices again. I take another term. That term here uh, could be um, address a start with country. I run that, and then you can see, okay, this is my gender distribution, and within my genders, uh, there are that many people in the, in the UK, that many in Italy, uh, that many in Germany, and that many in France. And then we could, for example, sub-bucket that again. Yeah, it starts all the way down. You can... <coughs> do this quite far down. And then I would, for example, say I want to see that by city. And also I want to, I don't like that view, I will make it a donut. I'll change that to a donut. I run it again. And then you can see, okay, I split it by gender, I split it by country, and within the country then I can see which is the largest city in my data set. So here I have England, and the largest city in England is obviously <laughs> Which it is not. Um, this is just not the greatest random data generator. It picked one city and just made that the largest one. And I think it's always Plymouth. Uh, and then the second largest one is London, which is yeah, far smaller. And then there's also Liverpool. And the same is then true for initially the largest city is for females uh, is Turin, whereas uh, in in Italy, the largest one uh, for males is over three. So that, that, that should be pretty equal. Uh, but yeah, we have just generated some random data and you can split it up whatever way you want to. You could, I don't know, see sales, where people are from, etc. Um, but we can also do other stuff. For example, if I create another visualization, I want to see uh, on a map where are people actually from. So I select my tile map. I say I want to see that on person. Uh, there's just the geo coordinates. This is the only field which are geo coordinates, so you can select that. I can run it. Okay, everybody is in Europe. That is no big surprise. And we can zoom in. Uh, yeah, okay. In Germany, let's go to Cologne. Yeah, and as you can see, um, the generator is not that clever, it's just like one random or box around flow, and it will just randomly generate people in there. Uh, but if you had a proper data set, uh, you could see then like where are most of my sign-ups or customers or whatever from. 
and you could hopefully get some meaningful information out of that. Can you see like where the females are as well? Like did you basically uh, <laughs> 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 uh, can you look at the data there except for location? Uh, yes you could do that, but not that easily right here now. You, you would need to, to filter that beforehand and then just visualize it. Because you, here, uh, just in my bucket, um, and beforehand you could like drill down by every term. Yeah. And here is just the geolocation. Yeah, right. Here is just the geolocation you can drill down. Uh, but you, um, if you use the JSON input, you should be able to do that. So you can just provide the JSON period and here. And just select the females and find the location of it. What would happen if you would just enter the search query on the top search field? Wouldn't that already filter your data? Oh, yeah, that should probably be true if I remember if the gen generator. Did the numbers change? Okay, yeah. So we can we can search it here, or for the more advanced searches, you can search it here because this input this is actually not an Elasticsearch um, query. This is just like a limited Kibana um, view where you can can search stuff. But yeah, I, I'm never using it because it never really does what, or it, it always misses some features I I, I need. Um, but yeah. You can search up there as well, uh, but normally with the JSON input, you're on the safe side and you can add your proper search queries. Okay, so this was if you had your own data set. Now, if you want to have your visualizations uh, of system metrics, we provide dashboards readily made for you. So, for example, here I have loaded up the processes, and you see the number of uh, processes running, uh, or the number of process IDs and the number of processes. You see, okay, these are my processes running, how much memory are they using? For example, Java is using most memory. That's not that surprising. Um, which processes are, are running Java here? Any ideas? No, not everything. Elasticsearch is Java. Logstash will be Java since it's also in the JVM. Uh, then we have metric beat, file beat, um, okay, those need some memory too. Uh, what is Node? There is Kibana, the visualization, that is a Node application, and, and Angular 1. Yeah, so as you can see, we are not very focused on a single programming language, it's just like pretty pragmatic, like this is what makes sense, so this is what somebody started with. So Elasticsearch uh, is Java, as Lucene is also Java. Um, Kibana <coughs> is Node and Angular, uh, Beats is Go, Loxes was Ruby, now it's JRuby, and we've also bought another company called Prelert, they have a C++ component. So, yeah, we're trying to get all the languages now. Um, let, let's see how long it will take to succeed. Yeah, and you see the same for the CPU usage, and you also Um, see what is going on, and if I have 80 years, this is not good for my visualization, let's step back to 15 minutes, and then you can actually see uh, how this is graphed out. But it, it wouldn't let me because it probably would crash my server if I tried to aggregate 80 years of log metrics, which I have every x seconds. Um, but here you can see um, which processors are taking up your memory or your CPU, and well, you can see Java metric feed, packet beat, file beat, and some nodes, whereas on the memory side, node is higher than the beats. But this is where uh, you, yeah, your system resources go on that virtual machine. But whatever server you have, you can see what is going on on it. And final thing is timeline. Uh, well, since I have only a single host, yes. Um, you could then drill down to, if you have lots of them, you could just see give me just that specific host or just give me multiple ones and you can compare that. And you, hopefully that way you can actually find like this server is making trouble, um, I need to look at it. 
The other thing um, that is kind of handy uh, is timeline. It's for time series. It's now also part of Kibana in version 5. And you can just visualize like all the data you have in your system. For example, yes, it has its own syntax again. Um, because that probably makes more sense for uh, time series data. Uh, but dot yes always accesses uh, uh, an Elasticsearch index, and I'm just uh, showing all of them. So for example, here I could say, just give me all the five B events. And you can see, okay, we had that many events per second over that time span. Or we can combine that, like, did we have more events from packet B? Um, yeah, okay, they're pretty much the same, maybe packet beat is a little higher. And we can also include metric beat in that mix. And then you can see, okay, metric beat, that's probably too much information. I want to uh, not show that one, so you can simply click it by removing. And you can, yeah, you can just see how much data you have. You can filter down on the feed, and it's just good for graphing you out time series. And you can also get data from external sources. For example, we have an integration into the World Bank data. And if you want to see how the population for Austria grew, but the last 15 minutes is not a great time frame for populations. Let's take 100 years. OK, you can see there probably not, no proper data was added. But since then, Austria has been growing quite a bit. And we could compare it to Germany, for example, then. <coughs> OK, Germany is still way bigger. Um, so no, no point in finding that. But we could, for example, say um, we want to know how stuff changes over time. So we want to create a derivative. And you can see, OK, Austria is pretty much stable and growing slightly, whereas Germany sometimes is growing, sometimes it's shrinking. And sometimes it has data anomalies. <laughs> yes, because something is off here, but yeah. Okay. We're nearly done. Uh, two common questions. Um, beats versus logstash. Will beats replace uh, logstash? No. Um, they're just like complementing each other. It's like beats is the thing, the library like, thing you put on all your servers, where logstash is, whereas logstash is something you put on one or a few centralized servers, uh, and they will do the parsing or get data from various systems. It's just like Beats is the lightweight thing you run, want to run everywhere, whereas Noxus is more centralized and doing some more heavy lifting. And then in version 5, we have a new node type. It's called Ingest Node. This is also taking over some parts of what Noxus is doing. It can now parse log files. So if you have some log line, and it's not JSON, but you need to parse it, you will need to provide some way to actually parse the log line. So it's like a regular expression, you say, OK, first thing is, I don't know, the, the HTTP status code, and then it's the user, and then it's something. And then you need the regular expression to parse that. In just note, and Logstash are using the same, we call it rock, the same patterns to match data. So you can easily start off with in just notes, so you run everything on Elasticsearch. If you need to scale out more, or you need to do more complicated stuff, then you can still use Logsash. So also, interest nodes are taking over some bits and pieces of what Logsash does, but for scaling out the more complicated tasks, Logsash will still be around, and it won't go away anytime soon. Okay, so to conclude, the Elastic Stack is, I always compare it to Lego. It's not really a solution built for one thing and doing that really well, but it's just like a building block. So you have all these dip, different bits and pieces just to get data, store data, query the data, visualize the data, build whatever yeah, visualizations you want to have, either for your system operations, for your business people, all of those. Um, but there is some assembly required. So you have the building blocks, but you will need to put them together. And you will never be able to, yeah, or it's the, the, the out of box experience is just not as nice as one of these, we call it one trick ponies. So if you have some logging tool that just does logging, but nothing else, of course, their starting experience is kind of nicer. But with the Elastic Stack, you're pretty much open to build whatever you 
might need or what your business need might come up with. Yeah, these are the open source components we've talked about. Just use them. Uh, should be very simple to get started. And if you just want to run the box and give that a try, um, all I've shown you, this is just a Vagrant box. So you clone the repository, you, if you have Vagrant, you just run Vagrant up. And it will install everything you need in the background then with Ansible. And then you can just start playing around with it and see um, if that helps with your business needs. Yeah, any questions? And I also have swag, I just need to get it out of my bag. Uh, don't let me forget. Yes, questions? Uh, I think a lot of companies already have Well, can you repeat the question? You know, yeah, I will repeat the question. The question was like, how does it compare to InfluxDB, Grafana, uh, and Graphite? Yeah, all these other systems. Well, the thing is, um, these are just very focused on on this uh, metrics yeah. use case, and we always always try to provide like more solutions on top around it. How it scales can be highly debated. Like there are some benchmarks out. Uh, we don't really do benchmarks with our competitors because people will always tweak their benchmarks to be the best. So you will need to find that out for yourself. I mean, we have lots of customers who do lots of events per second. This can be logs or whatever. I think our <coughs> top customers have more than a million events per second, and it scales. So we have clusters in the wild with 150 nodes, 300 nodes, whatever. Um, so it will scale, it will work. Um, I think the problem with InfluxDB is they've changed the business model, so single service is still open source and free, but multi-service are commercial now, which might be a pain point. Um, uh, Graphite, they don't really have much of a company behind it, right? It's, I mean, it's mainly an open source project and you can still use it, but I don't see any, or I don't really see the development speed or anybody really pushing it forward. It's working. If you have it working and it's fulfilling your needs, keep using it. Um, but if you want to have like something new and that's evolving much quicker, uh, yeah, we try to provide that and be in that space, yes. So historically we have started off in the full text search, um, then we moved on to logging, now it's more analytics and metrics as well, so we are trying to broaden <coughs> our use case and trying to be at least above average or good in every of these aspects and also make it easier just to have one system to do lots of stuff and not like have many systems and you need to have, have a very like fine split infrastructure. So the approach is like, hey, there is this tool that can do lots of stuff. Uh, we can do more and more with it. Yes. Just to mention it, actually Grafana can directly access Elasticsearch as a data source yeah. and that works like charm. Yeah, Grafana is, Grafana is a bit like Kitana. It's just the, the visualization part and then you can uh, query data from Elasticsearch uh, and Grafana, yeah. Is, is there alerting or some complex event processing capabilities? Yes, so there is alert, these are commercial features, but there is alerting that is a commercial feature that is available. And we have one and a half month ago or two months ago, we have um, bought a machine learning company and that should learn what is going on in the system and do the alerting then automatically. But that will be uh, paid as well. Throughout the day or throughout the whole time span? Well, it's, it's machine learning. It's learning A, what has been going on historically, but it's also like looking at stuff on a shorter time frame and then it kind of learns, well, machine learning learns, uh, what, what is to be expected and it has like, okay, this is the curve I'm expecting or this is the range where I expect new values to be in. And if you're out of that range, it will raise an alert. So if it's too many requests, too few requests, whatever, it will raise an alert. Because so far, the approach normally has been like people staring at their graphs intensely. And after a year, they know like, OK, today I expect this curve to happen. Um, but it's probably unnecessary, and the system can learn that much better and never miss anything. So this is what is pushing that. Yeah, it, well, it, it knows what is normal and then alerts you when something is not normal. So, 
But this is normally what, what you're looking for, like, I don't know, requests are too many requests, too few requests, uh, suddenly the response times are getting too high or whatever. So it is, it is learning and will then automatically tell you. And you do not need to put in all these rules, like, this is normal, this is not normal, uh, but it will just learn that automatically, like, once it sees production traffic. There was one other question somewhere. Well, I guess my time is up anyway. Um, thanks a lot. I'll wrap up swag.